across the county we hear them calling from every corner of this fair land the women who built this world of ours the women who built this world with science technology medicine engineering maths with courage and force I'm Ian Knowles, the Artistic Director and Theatre Manager here at Chelmsford City Theatres. Welcome to the digital version of Chelmsford Civic Theatre. This, the third of our online Zoom performances, a part of Essex 2020 in partnership with the amazing Electric Voice Theatre and Essex Music Education Hub. Welcome back to everyone who joined us last week and for everyone new joining us tonight. For tonight's performance, please look at the chat notes on how to pin the live BSL sign language interpreter video to your screen for people wishing to follow the signing of this event. And also look at the chat notes for any other technical issues. There will be a question and answer session after the performance tonight. So if you have any questions for any of our artists and experts, please send them to everyone in the chat box. As in the live theatre, please turn off your mobile phones. Please also put your microphones on silent and please turn your camera off. Otherwise you will be filmed and we will see all of you and we will know everything that you are doing. Turning now to tonight's performance of Sounding 3, Ellen Wilmot, the Botanical Gardener of Brentwood, our artists and experts tonight are Francis Lynch, the Artistic Director, Composer, Soprano from Electric Voice Theatre, Herbie Clark, Production Manager and Sound Design, Lauren Lister, British Sign Language Interpreter, David Shepherd, Countertenor, we have composer and artist Elseth Manners. Looking after us tonight from Chelmsford Theatre marketing team are Victoria and Alex. Our resident expert, Dr. Patricia Farah, science historian, fellow of Clare College, Cambridge. And I'm very pleased to introduce our scientific expert for tonight's performance, Dr. Hepsi Teiko, skin biologist and charity director at GH Scientific. After the performance, we open the virtual bar to you, our audience, so our experts and performers can respond to all of your questions. To start things off, I'm very proud to welcome to the civic stage from the Electric Voice Theatre, Frances Lynch, who I think actually seems as if she has travelled through a time portal and to now very much resemble Ellen Wilmot, a botanist from the 1800s who lived in Brentwood. But actually, we start the performance with a traditional piece of music by Imogen Holst, who also had a lifelong connection with Thaxted and its festivals. Imogen filled her Thaxted homes with books of country dance tunes and wrote this piece of music entitled A Sweet Country Life. A sweet country life is both pleasant and charming. All for to walk abroad on a fine summer's morning. Bright Phoebus did a shine, and the hills was adorning. As Molly, she sat a milking on a first summer's morning. No fiddle, no flute, no hot boy, no spirit is not to be compared with the fog of a linnet. Down as I did lie, all on those green rushes, t'was there I did hear the charms of the black. Thank 
Walter Wilmot lived in Essex over a hundred years ago, but she made a permanent mark on the Essex landscape. Worley Place Nature Reserve, which is just south of Brentwood. And here's a close-up of that notice board. You can see a map and a picture of Ellen Wilmot on the top right. When she last saw it, Worley Place didn't look like this. Instead, this was the magnificent garden she created by spending a small fortune. Alfred Parsons painted this picture over a hundred years ago, but this one was finished last week and it was specially commissioned for tonight's event. The artist, Elspeth Manders, has imaginatively recreated Ellen Wilmot's carefully manicured gardens. This is actually the left-hand side of a double panorama. So on the right, Manders has, conveys Wilmot's diminishing authorship of the garden as nature takes over. The daffodils and narcissus have become an amorphous foliage on the garden floor and time has reduced the conservatory to a shell. In its heyday, Worley Place was in the middle of the countryside, although there was a railway station nearby. And Ellen Wilmot and her garden were famous all over the world. The visitors who came to admire it included Queen Mary, Queen Alexandra and Princess Victoria. But when Ellen Wilmot died in 1934, she was bankrupt and developers brought up the property. The house was demolished, but luckily for Essex, planning permission for modern buildings was refused. So on the left is a 1930s housing development in Brighton, and on the right, Essex kept the row of magnificent ma chestnuts in Worley Place that had been planted in the 17th century. But after the Second World War, the garden degenerated into a wilderness, but res restoration work started in 1977 and is still continuing under the Essex Wildlife Trust. And these are just a few pictures of what the nature reserve looks like today. When Ellen Wilmot arrived 150 years ago, she immediately began shaping what exists now. So she moved there with her family when she was 17 years old. And you can get some impression of what she found from this view of the conservatory shot from the wall garden. And she immediately fell in love with its 33 acres of land. She stayed here for the rest of her life. She'd been a committed gardener from a young age. She later reminisced. I had a passion for sowing seeds and was very proud when I found out the difference between beads and seeds and gave up sowing the former. <laughs> for her 21st birthday, her father allowed her to build an alpine rockery and an artificial gorge. He was a wealthy, indulgent solicitor who laid down only one condition, no construction noise should reach his study. This was a major project, which involved creating a ravine with a stream running through it, as well as a cave for her filmy ferns. And this picture shows the original stones, although the bridge was added later. In 1894, she hired a Swiss gardener called Jacob Mora to cultivate her alpine garden. And this is, the Alpa, this is the South Lodge where he lived for 40 years with his wife and nine children. And as this photo suggests, she preferred a natural look to strictly cultivated flower beds. And from these paintings, you can see that her favourite plants were Narcissi, and she became a world expert. She experimented on a grand scale, asking her gardeners to load up their wheelbarrows with bulbs and then let their children scatter them at random over the hillside. And the bulbs grew where they fell and then multiplied over the years. When Ellen Wilmot was in her early 30s, she inherited a large sum of money from her wealthy godmother and she embarked on a prodigious spending campaign. She was a multi-talented woman and she splashed out on some specialised wood-turning lathes, which are now preserved at the History of Science Museum in Oxford, 
two violins, a viola and a cello, all of them antique, one of them a Stradivarius. And she bought some cameras. Uh, this is actually a photo of Mary Pickford, but it was taken in 1916. So it shows how Wilmot might have looked using the equipment of the period. She also acquired a microscope, a telescope, and a small printing press that she used for her seed catalogues. She almost doubled the size of the gardens by buying more land, and she hired a small army of gardeners. At first, she insisted on only employing men, saying, Women would be a disaster in the border. But during the war, she was forced to rely on women. The men had to work from six in the morning to six at night, and she designed a special uniform for them. A green silk tie, a boater with a green band, and a blue apron. So by 1904, the gardens included a bowling green, an alpine nursery, and a carnation house. But she didn't spend her money only on Worley Place, she also extended her activities abroad. She sponsored explorers such as Ernest Henry Wilson to look for plants overseas. These are photos from his expeditions to Taiwan and China, where he recruited local experts to, keep, to help him find the plants that he wanted. You can see the men at the right are loaded down with tea books. This is the beautiful garden she owned in Italy, near the coast. She also acquired a large estate in France. Eventually, she was forced to sell off these overseas properties because she'd been spending at an exorbitant rate. When she died, she had virtually no money left. She lived alone in her house, apart from her faithful butler, and many stories circulated about her eccentricity. For example, rather like Margaret Thatcher, people speculated about what she carried in the handbag that accompanied her everywhere. Now, I have no idea what Thatcher put in there, but I'm pretty sure that it didn't contain a loaded revolver like Ellen Wilmot's. This sounds pretty weird. On the other hand, perhaps it was a sensible precaution for a small elderly woman who lived on her own and was known to be very rich. But there's another story about her handbag, which is even less likely to be true. Supposedly, she also carried seeds of the giant prickly thistle, which she scattered in other people's gardens so that they mysteriously sprung up all over the place. Although this photo is from Worley itself. They became known as Miss Worley's, as Miss Wilmot's ghosts. And that's what they're still called in the plant catalogue. But whether or not the myths about her are true, Ellen Wilmot was certainly not just a rich crank. She was a dedicated horticulturalist with a worldwide reputation. She was invited to advise on other garden projects. So, for example, she worked with the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust to redesign the gardens at New Place in Stratford and at Anne Hathaway's cottage. The Royal Horticultural Society is among England's oldest and most important scientific institutions. And she became a member in 1894, when she was still in her 30s, and three years later was one of only two women to be awarded a special medal to celebrate Queen Victoria's Jubilee. She played a very active role in the society and was on several special committees, and because she was so famous, she had plenty of influential contacts, and she played a key role in acquiring the Society's current headquarters at Wisley. In 1905, she became one of the earliest women to be admitted as a Fellow of the Linnaean Society. That was an enormous honour. Ellen Wilmot was a hands-on gardener 
with a passion for collecting as many plants as she could from all over the world. She accumulated an incredibly large number. A distinguished professional botanist, William Stearns, remarked, She grew some 100,000 different kinds of plants supremely well. And a large number of them bear her name. When Ernest Henry Wilson returned from his expeditions to China and the Middle East, he expressed his gratitude by naming three plants after her. So there's this gorgeous blue plumbago, and there's this yellow corylopsis, and this delicate pink rose. Because she was so famous, many other flowers were later named after her as well, but she was particularly renowned for her work on roses. She published a two-volume handbook for horticulturalists, and these are just three of the 132 illustrations. After publishing this handsome book, she went on gardening and inspiring others for the next 20 years. But then she died suddenly and unexpectedly. She's buried in Brentwood Cathedral because she and her family were devout Catholics. Ellen Wilmot's name will endure forever through the plants named after her and through the nature reserve at Worley Place. Now, because of lockdown, I haven't been able to visit the nature reserve myself, but when I saw the photo on the left, I was immediately reminded of medieval walled gardens and their association with the Virgin Mary, which seems a particularly appropriate link because of Ellen Wilmot's Catholicism. That so all gardens are symbolically a place of refuge, a cultivated area that is demarcated from the wilderness outside. Their cultural origins lie in the Garden of Eden, but it's impossible to revert to an, uh, an original state of nature. Ellen Wilmot's carefully landscaped property is now a nature reserve, but that has to be tamed, for and cared, tamed and cared for just as much as a more formal garden. So, for example, these great tits are natural creatures, but they depend on human interventions to keep them alive. Like the prickly thistles known as Miss Wilmot's ghosts, her ambitious garden design will continue to haunt Worley Place Nature Reserve forever. I will indeed haunt this place with my sister ghosts, Margaret Cavendish, born 200 years ago in Colchester, and the mathematical Elizabeth Thompson found Forget refuge it. in stratford le We will haunt it. Essex Forget until it. we are remembered. Now, I must return to the garden. You cannot leave these gardeners alone, unsupervised, for a moment. A weed could appear almost anywhere. Indeed, I found one only yesterday. Yes, we must continue. It's just a shame about my hands. They're becoming so rough with all this work. A little dry and irksome, I find them. But one must go on. One must. Perhaps if I had known Dr. Tago all those years ago, she may have been able to give me some help. Hello everyone, I am Dr. Hefsa Tago, a skin biologist and charity director at GH Scientific. So a little bit about my research. Um, 
I look into is a condition known as ichthyosis and specifically we're looking into the signaling mechanisms internally that lead to the outward scaling that we see as dry flaky itchy skin. Um, so on the spectrum of ichthyosis disease um, the mild end is the more common conditions uh, which most of you may be familiar with such as eczema and psoriasis. The models that we use on the extreme end um, is what we call um, ALCI, so autosomal recessive congenital ichthyosis. These are born with, and usually when the child is born, they are covered in um, cling like film material, which um, after a week or two starts to fall off and reveals thick scales all around the skin. Now, if you think about the scales as you will see on the fish, these scales are. Um, a lot thicker than you would on this um, on form skin and so over uh, it's a permanent condition and what we've been trying to do is to find out specifically what is going wrong internally that is causing these external features that we see more recently i've been looking into the impact of mental health conditions on patients who suffer from dry skin because it has come to light that really it's one of those things that it's not being addressed as much. And if you consider having to live with a lifetime condition, not just the more common milder ends like eczema, um, but then the extreme ichthyosis gen and genetic conditions in itself. On the other side uh, with GH Scientific, where we do the science communication, it's mostly looking at the, um, trying to take the complex science out of the lab onto um, into public spaces and out in the communities and so one way we do that is through the annual Basildon Street Science Festival which started um, actually in Chelmsford in 2014 and transitioned to Basildon from 2016. Sadly this year it has gone online because of Covid but we have a lot of science busking, we bring in a lot of scientists from all over the UK and it's just out in the open space and the idea is that if we can't get the people who are not plugged in with science already to come to the science then we have to be out in the spaces where um, everyone hangs out all the time so whether it's the marketplaces whether it's town centers and just out on the streets and that is the idea behind Basildon Street Science. So that's me, Skin Biologist and Charity Director at GH Scientific. Hi, Hi. that was so interesting Hefsi. I just wondered when Miss Mil Wilmot was here just as she left she was complaining that her hands felt very sore um, do you think you could have helped her? I mean, if if you know if you'd have been there a hundred years ago, could you have sorted out that skin condition she had? I like to think I could have at least had an idea why the hand felt sore. Maybe not the the um, solution yet, but the problem, yes, we can identify it. Right. You think she might have picked up something from the soil? Does that happen? No, you can't actually pick up a skin disease from the soil, but you can um, come in contact with chemicals or other agents in the ground that can agitate or irritate um, the oh, right. skin and perhaps obviously lead on to dry and itchy skin as well, but not a permanent skin condition. Oh, I see. So at the end, when you were talking about busking, it yeah. seems obvious that you've had quite a bit of experience of, as a scientist of working with musicians. Can you tell us a bit about how that felt? How that felt, um, so the work that I have done with musicians in the past, um, I say artists in general, basically um, involves young people as well. So a lot of the work uh, we do is tailored to um, the younger audience. And so um, they come up with a science concept that they want to be creative about. So it can be spoken word, it can be music, it can be um, fine art. And they work with the artists to, um, translate the theoretical science into an art form and so we've had um, periodic tables songs from the periodic table is a popular one that students don't really come up with and come up with their own tunes and work with artists to come up with things like that so yes okay well let's bring in Elspeth Elspeth Manders is the artist who produced those wonderful pictures of Worley Place and she's also a composer we're going to hear some of her music later so Elspeth, as a, um, a composer and an artist, how, how does it feel for you working with scientists this time? Oh, it's lovely. I mean, I, although I'm not a scientist myself, I have always had an interest 
in scientific imagery so things like the scale and the beauty of the cosmos I, I paint a lot of planets and things um, things like flowers and trees they're all linked to biology they're all interlinked and so it's lovely to be involved in this project which celebrates science um, to be able to create something in art and music to reflect upon that oh great so had either of you heard of miss ellen wilmot before or was she new to you both i hadn't um which it is strange because I live so close to where she lived and to, to Wally Place on a 20 minute drive away, but I hadn't heard of her. And um, I'm coming to her now. And is it important for you? Me that she... neither. <laughs> Sorry, Kev, so you, you, have you heard of her either? You no, heard... I hadn't, not until tonight, I hadn't. And is it interesting, important for you that she came from Essex? Do you feel yourself rooted in Essex? I think for me, I literally am rooted in Essex because I was born in Essex and I've been here for 20 odd years um, so the fact that it is so close to home and what she does is of such a natural interest to me it's really nice and what I what you told me is that um, when we when you started on this project you actually went to Wally Place didn't you I, yeah the for the, for the first time it was for the first time the moment I heard from Francis and I looked it up on Google Maps and realized how close it was went straight there because the best way to be inspired is to actually go and see what you're working with. And what was it when you went, got there, what was it that, you, that struck you most and how, how did you manage to transform that experience and put it on a canvas? I think what struck me was the notion of change. Um, if you think about how the garden was a hundred years ago when Ellen's authorship was really palpable, it was really manicured. Um, but now different forces are taking hold, nature is taking precedence and Wally Place now, it's, it is less manicured but her authorship is still there in a way, I think shown through some of the flowers which still remain from back then, for example her ghost as you mentioned in your powerpoint. So mm -hmm. what really struck me is change but also this relative harmony between nature and history. So, um, Hepsi, how, how did you feel when, when, you, when you saw the programme, the PowerPoint about Ellen Wilmot? Did you find that interesting? Really interesting, actually. Very fascinating. And I totally um, enjoyed um, the, the session re rehearsals and now. But yeah. Um, yeah, I am going to look at a bit more information, actually, after this, because it's a fascinating um, story. And what, what made you choose science as a career? Um, I think science found me. I can't remember um, on a hard moment. You. That's a lovely thing. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember on a hard moment where I thought, oh, yeah, science is what I must do. Um, I just naturally um, skewed towards the sciences. And so I did take all science and math for A levels and actually went to university to do um, science. And I've stayed in science ever since. And how did you end up specialising in skin conditions? I mean, that sounds a bit of an unusual niche to land up in. Yeah, interesting. So, again, it was a case of when I wanted to specialise, and I started off in biomedical science, so more broad biology and chemistry, and then I branched out into the pharmaceutics for a bit, which I found a bit dull. <laughs> but um, it was... I had to pick a PhD, so I specialised through my PhD, and for me it had to be a condition I could relate to. I don't have a long-term um, skin condition, but then it's something that I could relate to everyday people. Eczema is very common, a lot of people um, suffer from skin conditions, mm -hmm. and so if I was going to spend years specialising in a subject area, it had to make sense, and uh, that's how I came about um, being in skin biology. Okay, and Elspeth, can I ask you a similar question? How did you end up being a composer and an artist? I mean, I think I've got to quote Hepsi here. Uh, music and art found me. <laughs> they, they were just That's a very good way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> you have to copyright it. Now, yeah. um, I, I just always, I experimented with a lot of different interests and um, pursuits when I was younger, and those were the two that I naturally gravitated towards. Um, and then at university I've made the choice to study music because I always had an academic interest in music and that's when I really developed my sphere as a composer and alongside that I've kept up the art by being a, a freelance artist. So 
when you, in your career as a musician, have you ever, or as an artist, have you ever experienced any discrimination because you're a woman? Do you think that is a problem? I think um, it is a problem in some ways. It certainly has been a problem. If you look back at the canon of composers, there are remarkably few women. Mm. Um, and actually, one of the nice things about uh, learning about Ellen Wilmot was that she was good friends with one of the only female composers to make it into the English pastoral canon, um, which was Ethel Smith. Um, well, can you tell us a bit about Ethel Smith? Uh, Ethel Smith was a composer of folk songs, of madrigals, um, and was a peer of uh, Ellen Wilmot and of the iconic school of composers at the time, so Stanford and Parry. So she was one of the, the biggest names um, as a female composer back then, but there weren't many. Um, was it her who wrote the, uh, the Suffrage March or was that Ellen Smythe? I actually don't, I think yeah. e Ethel Smith, uh, Ethel Smith is spelled S-M-Y-T-H. Yeah, okay. Well, I think... Oh, was... Ethel Smith. She I... was a great friend of mine. And she definitely wrote the March of the Women. So, Miss Wilmot, did you ever sing the voice of the March of the Women? Could you oh, give a, a, Lord, a few yes. parts? Oh, good Lord, yes. Are you going to sing it for us? No. <laughs> no? <laughs> I thought you said yes. I'm busy gardening. <laughs> oh, okay, you go back to your gardening and keep those gloves on so you don't hurt your hands. So let me ask Hefsi's a similar question. Um, it's very, very well known that in the past there's been a lot of discrimination uh, against women in science. And one of the things I tried to emphasise in my talk is that she was one of the first few women in the Linnaean Society. There were only two women who won the Horticultural Prize. As a woman, have you ever experienced any discrimination in science? So, um, yes, I would also echo that, that discrimination against women, women in science does exist. Um, and although we are working gradually towards overcoming that, it is still um, prominent. Personally, I haven't experienced um, any discrimination directly. Um, the only time that comes to mind was when I um, felt pregnant with my second daughter during my PhD and I think it was more a case of judging myself feeling that everyone else around me um, would be judgmental against are you coming here to do research or are you here to have a baby and so I actually did not tell my supervisor or anyone else around me until probably seven months into the pregnancy and um, that in itself was challenging every day trying to get the right clothes so no one can see your belly popper now but um, I think it was perhaps things have internalized myself um, about judgments rather than anyone um, being discriminatory and actually when I did eventually tell my supervisor he was quite upset that I didn't tell him earlier on and so that he could have supported me as best as he could and I say he because um, it was a male supervisor and um, I even wanted to come back three months um, um, after delivery and he said no it takes six months otherwise you're not going to focus and he was very supportive but that's not to say the issue of discrimination against women in science does not exist. Yeah, well, that's great yes. that your supervisor was so uh, supportive. Uh, did you, you know, this problem of women with children, women without children, did you ever feel that women without children were rather prejudiced against you as having... <laughs> I, mean, I, I have heard stories that women without children feel that they're asked to do more work and they're asked to take on responsibilities while, while parents rush off to get their kids from the nursery or something. Have you experienced that and do you think it's fair? Uh, again, for me, I'd probably say the things I've internalised myself because I haven't um, personally had any or any of my colleagues um, during all that time sort of say, um, why are you always getting special favours or you need to be here as well? But it was that feeling of perhaps in the silent undertone, so everyone's staying late to work and you have to leave because you've got childcare and then their shoes are closed and then you're always the person having to leave when everyone else is still at your desk. And mm -hmm. so there is some internal guilt that you self, self process, not so much perhaps no one's passing judgment, but um, you sort of feel everyone's still here when I'm leaving, but what can you do? <laughs> and... In some ways, I mean, all the lockdown, uh, you're, you, presumably you're working at home, are you? 
I um, am, yes. Yeah, so does that help you deal with that problem that you can fit in your childcare with the rest of your work? So that in a way you're more similar to all the other people working in the lab. Is it, has it worked like that? Um, I'm actually less productive, to be honest with you, having the kids at home because... Yeah. Um, How old are they now? They are only four and seven. Oh my so god! Four and seven. I couldn't imagine yeah, so working. So quite late. <laughs> now, yeah, so actually less productive because we've got to homeschool as well. Um, especially for the four-year-old, we can't leave yeah. her on her own to go off and do her work. And so then my working hours are spent in the park and reading and homeschooling. And so then I've got the evenings to catch up on everything. Yeah, it's. I mean, a lot of my friends are saying this is really, really hard. I mean, if you've got children. Elspeth, what's your, been your experience of lockdown? How's it affected you? Um, so initially I was put on furlough. I work, I actually work at Chelsea Cathedral, which is, has very strong links with Brentwood Cathedral. Ellen is buried, again, <laughs> another link. Um, and then I returned back to work full time just a, a week ago. And yeah, I, I've been really lucky that I have a space where I'm able to work um, in quiet and in, in a nice environment at at home. So although I'm not in the office anymore, uh, lockdown and the experience I, I've had it is still conducive to working. Okay. So have you got any questions you you two would like to ask each other instead of me asking you separately? What, what I mean, perhaps you could <laughs> share your experiences of what it's felt like to work on this project. Because it's the first time either of you have been involved in it. So how, how have you found it? And perhaps you could chat about that. Well, were you initially daunted by the, the prospect of learning about someone completely new? <laughs> <laughs> no, not really, because I'm, I'm, I'm quite curious. I love learning new things and discovering new things. And um, particularly where I'm not originally from Essex, um, being involved in this project has been amazing because you get to learn a lot more about the county and the borough. So yeah, that has been great. Yeah. I love artists though. Gosh, she's so young. Sorry, I had to say that. <laughs> yes, one question I've always had for artists though. So um that question, what instruments would you recommend for a seven year old when you start an art and music? Uh piano definitely, because you you have to learn both clefs, the treble and the bass clef. Um, and it's a great introduction into rhythm, melody and harmony. I'd also recommend singing because that's really good for picking up oral skills. Great, perfect. Well, that's really helpful advice and I hope Miss Wilmot would approve of that advice and I hope she's approved of what we've, what we've been chatting about because I think she's waiting in the wings with some more music. I was thinking about one's appearance and wondered why it is that women are often judged on their appearance. For some women, it appears to rule their lives. But for me, the flowers are where the beauty lies. It is in their appearance that I wish to be judged. <laughs> My sister Rose, that name, it so identifies with her. She loved to be among the flowers. I do miss her in the garden. I missed her when she married, and then when she died. I wrote an obituary for her in the Essex Naturalist. I quoted a poem I was very taken with at the time, an English translation of something from the Middle East. Yes, I, I was so taken with it, and, and, and so you can imagine my delight when a young lady from Chelmsford, Miss Manders, presented me with some music which set the very same poem that I had so admired for my own little singing group. And we shall sing it this evening for the very first time. <laughs> i